Hello, everybody. Some old man. I've missed a couple of days, and I almost missed today. But we're going to put it together. I have a couple of subjects to talk about today. First, let's go ahead and talk about that under the sink cabinet work that I was doing. We finished it up for the most part today. And I wanted to go ahead and show you the films of the sections when we did. First, a couple of pictures. This is the undershelf cabinet as I have all the pieces cut to fit. And this is the pieces as I actually paint them. As you can see, I've got all my support sections cut and in more or less in place. They're not fastened, but we'll fasten them as we bring in the, uh, in the platform sections. And here are my platform sections. I cut into three just because it was easier to go ahead and fit the individual sections around the plumbing and wiring if I had the part that had cutouts broken into two. So I'm going to go ahead and put these in and then pull the drill out and start drilling the holes to fasten to the supports. And of course I had to go ahead and take, after one step forward, I had to take two steps back because I forgot to put my steel wool in between the boards there to help uh, prevent any uh, rodent problems. So now I have to go ahead and do that. If I can figure out how to get this stuff unwound. I've never actually worked with this kind of steel wool before. Not that it is that big of a problem. We'll figure it out. This comes in fairly large bats. Hope I have enough. Ah. There we go. Lots of fun. It'll be slightly easier to put them back in since the holes are pre drilled, except for these holes, which are whoop, it helps with my tightening.
Good news and bad news. I shifted the one board over just a little bit, which is not so good. Which means I have to re-drill that hole. C'est la vie. Well, after much, much fussing and cussing, we managed to get the uh, first board in and uh, fastened down. I don't know if you can see it in the picture or not, but I've uh, gone ahead and started on the second half. I put uh, the steel wool in between the, uh, the joists, and now I'm going to go ahead and put in the new uh, boards on top. Hopefully everything will go together as well as it did when I was test fitting the things the other night. And that's how it's going to look when it's done. I just have to drill in my holes now and put in screws. Which is a lot more work than it looks like, but I'm just not quite able to crawl around down there like I used to when I was young. But we'll get it done and then we'll be able to go ahead and turn on the power and plug things back in. I still have to go ahead and put my power back box and screw it down to the uh, floor as well, but that'll be fairly easy because I, I can do it right in front. But let me go ahead and uh, get work with the screwdriver or the uh, drill and here's the drill bit. Well, I won't say I'm done, but I'm getting close. I still have some screws to put in on the right side, especially the ones further back, but it is in place, and this is what it's gonna look like when I'm done. Just have to go ahead and make sure that all those screws are in and the thing's not going to come popping out for no reason. The reason I use screws instead of nails, even though it's a little harder to put in, is the fact that if I ever want to take it out, it'll be real simple. Well, that's all I've got on this one, so we'll go ahead and head back to the computer and give it a little bit of a talk. Yesterday, I was able to go over to one of my, to the local prepper, net, prepper group and actually had a presentation on a couple of different subjects. One, they talked about things you can do to overcome COVID if you are so unfortunate as to catch it, which everybody will at some point. I took some notes while I was at the, uh, at the meeting, and I thought they were worth talking about. First, COVID treatments. Chlorine dioxide is one treatment. You could go ahead and drink uh, a chlorine dioxide drink. It's probably 5% chlorine dioxide in uh, whatever fluid you're drinking, water or juice or whatever. It doesn't taste particularly good. It tastes like pool water, but it will actually help uh, your body resists a lot of uh, bacteria and infectious type things, including uh, COVID. Chlor chlo colloidal silver. And this is one that I actually will probably go ahead and resort to if it comes to that. This is a ionized silver solution, and there are means of getting it, but... Uh, what you have to do if you're going to drink that, uh, you need to go ahead and drink a mixture of baking soda and water, not much baking soda, maybe a quarter teaspoon mixed into water dissolved. Drink that, wait 15 minutes. What that is gonna do is knock out the stomach acids so that you could drink the colloidal silver and actually have it get into your system because otherwise, it is the silver is going to react with the stomach ex acids in your stomach and turn into uh, 
silver uh, chloride, which won't do as much good against uh, the different things and you know uh, the different uh, bacteria and viruses and so forth in your system. So you drink the uh, baking soda solution first, and then after 15 minutes or so, a half cup of colloidal silver, and that is probably. 25% colloidal silver. It's not particularly strong, but just enough to get it into your system. The third thing you can, oh, and the other way you could apply uh, either one, the colloidal silver is in a nebulizer or in a humidifier. That will do similar things, but it'll go in through your lungs. And it, in some ways, it's better. And if you do both, it's good too. The third thing that they mentioned was hydrogen peroxide. You can go ahead and drink hydrogen peroxide too in a small amount, but it'd be better to go ahead and use the nebulizer or humidifier for those things as well. Uh, and of course, the hydrogen peroxide, you don't drink very much of it, it's diluted with water and so forth. But those are just three things that they mentioned that I found interesting. The other thing, they had a presentation about pre-World War II Germany and the parallels to what we're seeing in the United States right now. And some of the key points that they talked about for uh, pre-World War G Germany, the economy was trashed in Germany, the Weimar Republic. Uh, coming out of World War I, they were having to play some massive reparations to the rest of the world because of the fact that they lost. And that's part of what left the in, uh, economic conditions that let Hitler walk in. Uh, they had human experimentation, social socialism, anti-capitalism. You'll see a lot of that paralleled in the current American uh, things. 80% taxation. We haven't gotten there yet, thankfully, although there are some people calling for it. Socialized, social health care. Can we say Obamacare, anybody? Government regulations. Regulations on everything. And we're seeing a lot of that. Gun control. There are calls for gun control. Right now, there are a lot of pro-Second Amendment folks and states that are pushing back against this, so maybe we've got some breathing room. S spying on fellow citizens was encouraged, and we're seeing some of that encouraged now here in the states. Abortion was proposed and actually encouraged in that time religion was discouraged. Propaganda was a big big thing back then and racial segregation which of course was culminated in uh, the Holocaust and the Jews. Now I don't know I haven't actually studied this period I'm sure that the people who were presenting this yesterday at uh, this meeting actually did study it and there were one or two people in the audience who also knew what they were talking about and brought up additional points but this list of kind of things is something that maybe we ought to be aware of so just thought I'd mention it here I think we are doing good we had a power outage today and the power just came back on here a little while ago, which is why I'm able to get on here, turn on the computers, and record, finish recording this video. But the power had been out, and we would kept everything shut down to a minimum to make the batteries for the for the solar bank actually last longer. The the little uh, app that goes on our phones said, "Oh, it's good for about six hours." So we were watching it pretty close. It would have probably cut out here 
in two or three more hours if the power had not come back on. But since it's come back on, now the power bank is recharging and we've got plenty of juice coming out of the grid. Um, it's kind of nice in one way because it says, oh, what are you short on your preparations? And I know that we learned some of the ways that uh, the different power backups we've got work and they get a little bit of a jiggle and that one down in the kitchen that that back up, backs up the fish tank doesn't handle those power interrupts very well. You got to go ahead and hit a reset button. Same for uh, the one in the uh, that handles the internet modem. It's a learning process. Uh, we do know that we've got five to eight hours of juice in the main battery. I sure wish I could afford to go out and buy three more of those Telsa walls, but those are not in the cards. I'm thinking that if it push comes to shove, I would like a bigger external generator. The one that I've got will run the freezer or the refrigerator or lights and such, but it won't run everything. And one thing that I'm a little worried about now is if it has an extended power outage in the cold, like today was, that we have no way to run the furnace. So we'll be dependent on other things to keep ourselves warm until it warms up and the power comes back. Just something to think about. And I encourage you, if you haven't made any preparations, to think about how you would go ahead and get through an extended power outage or any other disaster. That's it for today. This is Some Old Man, signing off.